What's up, everybody? It is your favorite white guy here, Hunter Avalon here. And yes, I am currently dressed like a Christmas tree. And no, I'm not ashamed of it. So sit your ass down, ho ho hoes. Once again, I am recording this video because our good friend Matt Walsh has dropped by again uh, with more stupidity this time. Uh, now you see he is very concerned with wokeism infiltrating video games. Ooh, spooky, I know. So here's a statistic that, at least if you were born at any point prior to the 1990s, might be hard to believe. By revenue, the gaming industry is bigger than both the movie industry and the music industry combined. And for the past several years, it hasn't been especially close. Whoa. I'm mind blown at that fact. Thank you, Matt, for, for educating us. Thank you, Professor. The difference is consistently more than $100 billion per year. So video games are a massive market, one that's mostly targeted at young people, of course. But despite those numbers, for the most part, the games industry has avoided mainstream scrutiny. You'll see far more discussion. What? About Wasn't there a whole thing called like Gamergate where there was massive controversy surrounding game companies? <laughs> Isn't there still like constant conservative whining about the woke video games and whatnot? See, this is what conservatives do all the time, where they want to make what they're saying seem far more novel, so they act as though they're the first ones who are, who's ever said it, even though that's obviously not the case, even though every brain-dead conservative inbred is bitching and whining about video games being woke, Matt Walsh is up here like, this has actually never happened before. Listen up, I'm about to give you some new information. He just wants to make it seem more novel about, say, Sidney Sweeney or Taylor Swift than you'll ever see about prominent video game voice actors and directors who pretty much no one knows anything about. Everyone's heard of Lionsgate or Paramount, but almost no one's heard of studios like Don't Nod Entertainment, for example. And that's significant because these no-name studios are behind the single most coordinated effort to indoctrinate millions of children through entertainment that's ever occurred in this country. This effort is maybe more powerful than the teachers' unions, if only because these propagandists... Indoctrinate kids, a.k.a. give kids a certain message... Again, these are private companies that are designing games. They can choose the message that they want to portray. You realize that all forms of media are trying to portray some kind of a message, right? But by that logic, every form of media is also a form of indoctrination, which would be ridiculous. About one of the companies behind this indoctrination effort called Sweet Baby Inc. or SBI. And in a moment, I'll get into the details about what exactly that organization is doing and who's helping them do it. But first, uh, I want to get the good news out of the way which is that if there's any silver lining, it's that this effort to indoctrinate children is incredibly ham-fisted. Some of the dumbest people in the world are behind it. So take that studio I just mentioned, Don't Nod Entertainment. They're behind the very popular Life is Strange video game series, which has been played by tens of millions of people. Life is Strange. What is the, video the rating? Okay, so keep in mind that he's talking about these video games as if they are designed to indoctrinate children. Yet this game he's now talking about is rated M. For violence, blood, sexual themes, strong language, and drug use. <laughs> this game isn't even meant for kids. It's not even rated that it's okay for kids. But apparently that's, uh, that, that's still trying to indoctrinate kids. To give you an idea of how overt the propaganda is in Life is Strange, here's just one mercifully short sequence involving, what else, a racist white guy. There's some backstory about how he kidnapped an innocent Hispanic kid or something, uh, and, and then this, watch. Gonna tell the police you kidnapped me. Nice try. But I know who you are and what you did in Seattle. I saw it in the paper. Maybe I should call ICE to make sure you're a citizen. You hillbilly. I'm American. Mm. Watch it, punk. Whatever. I'm going to jail for this. Pretty sure the local police are vouch for me over a thug like you. Where's my brother? Wish I knew. Little sh took off. I'll find him. Don't worry. If you touch it... You think I'd hurt a little boy? Guess you didn't have any second thoughts about leading him out into the middle of nowhere, though. That's real safe for a little kid. If he's lucky, he won't end up like his criminal big brother. Just let me go. Please. You're the reason we need to build that wall. You hold tight. I love it. I love that Matt Walsh is just crying about a video game cutscene because it disses Trump supporters. He He's so mad about it. He thinks it must be woke. No, dude, that's just dissing Trump supporters. I'm sorry, my friend. Now, I guess I lied. I said that it was mercifully short, but that felt like uh, three hours long. And I will say also that, you know, this is um, neither here nor there. Well, maybe it's not, but, you know, when I... Obviously, I don't pay much attention to video games. When I started looking into 
this story we're talking about now and watching some of these videos, I was like, I, I sort of expected the, the the graphics and just the overall quality to be better now um, and than than it than it is because really low quality all around. But he says uh, we need to build a wall. Uh, that's according to the white racist kidnapping the innocent Hispanic boy. And this is a game that, if Wikipedia is to be believed, received generally positive reviews upon release. Critics praised the story. So we can conclude that the bar is incredibly low in this entire industry. All the developers have to do is beat their audience over the head with rote left-wing propaganda, and their game will be... I mean, the rating is 9 out of 10 IGN, 85% Metacritic, 4 out of 5 Common Sense Media. Just if you're triggered by it doesn't mean that everybody else is going to be. ...well-reviewed and well-received. The more recent game, Suicide Squad, is another prominent example. They decided to write a story about Batman's toxic masculinity, which ended with a girl boss shooting Batman. Spoiler, apologize for that, should have warned you. Anyway, here's part of that sequence. You had a good run, Brucey. Flying around Gotham, punching bad guys, clean up the streets, causing long-term mental and emotional damage to everyone you knew. It's our turn now. After all we've been through. Oh. But you didn't think it'd be me at the end, huh, Bits? Are we done with your bad stand-up routine? Almost. But you always gotta end on your best joke. That's, I can't watch any more of that. Uh, so, Suicide Squad is, it was always weird and always like deviated from the, the general premise of the, the DC films. Not to mention, wasn't Suicide Squad always kind of about like the girl boss? Okay, it's literally called Kill the Justice League. I like that I've never even heard about these games and all I had to do was Google it and right away I'm like, oh. That's the point of the game. Isn't the movie already about Harley Quinn and the girl boss and everything? Having a game in which you kill Batman because that's the object of the game, that, that's not going woke, dude. You're just being an idiot. Uh, that's, uh, okay, well, you can imagine just how many purple-haired women must work at that studio. I mean, they probably provide the hair dye on tap uh, in their company. Really? I would think that the purple-haired, woke, libcuck feminists would be way too triggered by guns to have a video game like that that was super violent and gory. Really? Now, I didn't play that game, obviously. I haven't played any of these games. Uh, I'm not a video game fan or player, as most people, I think, know by now. But the point is that these clips were all... Well, you look like one. Got him. ...over the internet because of how awful they are. They're just terrible in every way, even just from a quality perspective. Again, uh, they're bad, even if you happen to agree with their politics. But the fact remains that for children of a certain age, the propaganda doesn't need to be subtle. All they got to do is present it to children, and it can be effective. And that's why some anonymous people using the games platform Steam decided to figure out exactly who's putting this garbage in games and why. And they found that the company I mentioned earlier called Suicide Squad Game is also rated M. I just looked it up. Dude, what, what is this thing about indoctrinating kids through media that's not meant for kids? Uh, Sweet Baby Inc. I have to say no relation to the Sweet Baby Gang. I swear off any association. I would file a lawsuit for copyright infringement, if not for the fact that I don't have a copyright, and also Sweet Baby Inc. existed first, technically, but never mind that. Anyway, these people on uh, Steam found that Sweet Baby Inc. has contracted with major publishers to push pr the principles of DEI in video games as aggressively as possible. Sweet Baby Inc., or SBI, uh, worked with the developers of the game I just showed you, Suicide Squad, and they've also had a role in several other major releases recently. On their website, SBI boasts that they're committed to installing principles of diversity into games, and they do it forcibly. In fact, the founder and CEO of SBI, a woman named Kim Belair, recently spoke to game developers and instructed them to threaten their companies unless they comply with Sweet Baby's DEI mandates. Watch. And if you're in- Okay, let's go ahead and hear what they're, what, what she's saying here. By the way, this is a private company. So a private company wanting to focus on diversity and inclusion with their own content that they produce privately, fully within their rights. And if you're in development and you are part of like that dominant voice, you're like a cis hetero white dude or just adjacent to that, do not wait until the end to call your consultants. Bring them in at the beginning and instead of asking them, hey, is this very racist thing we did very racist or is this deeply offensive thing we did deeply offensive, are you hurt by it? Ask them what they wanna see, like ask them what would thrill them, what would bring them joy and if you have a team lead, put that request to them very, very early. Um, if you're a creative working in AAA, which I did for many, many years, um, Put this stuff up to your higher ups. And if they don't see the value in what you're asking for when you ask for consultants, when you ask for research, go have a coffee with your marketing team and just terrify them with the possibility of what's gonna happen if they don't give you what you want. Hmm. Uh, okay. 
she just means negotiate really hard for the goals that you want. AAA, build connections with marketing to express the value of inclusion. M maybe she could have phrased the, the terms better, I guess, but really like make sure they're terrified until they realize like this, she's just talking about negotiating really hard. Hmm. Again, only a spineless little pussy would watch that clip and, and, and get scared. But then again, Matt Walsh is a spineless little pussy. So this is how DEI works in every industry, of course. The goal is not to improve the company's product in any way. It's to blackmail companies and threaten them into submission. And in this case, they're just saying it out loud. Wouldn't more inclusion thus make your game more appealing to a larger demographic, thus make your game more successful? Wouldn't you want to have more inclusion at the end of the day? Pay the DEI tax or we will destroy you. Only in the games industry where That's everyone- literally not at all what they said. They were talking about if you were working in a company to meet with the marketing team and make sure that they know how important it is that you value inclusion and you want to see some games like that. That's really what they said. Not blackmail them into doing it. Is dumber than they are in every other industry. Do they just come right out and say it as directly as that? Along these lines, as you might've guessed, so-called games journalists are somehow even dumber than journalists in other industries too, which I mean is really, really saying something. They're just completely unable to hide their real goals or display any hint of subtlety whatsoever. For example, in response to clips like, like this surfacing, games writers have, uh, have produced uh, several articles portraying SBI as the victim of a harassment campaign, by which they mean people are noticing what SBI is doing. And we know that on the left, the worst thing you can ever do is just notice. Noticing is the greatest crime of all. And people are noticing, and so that's harassment. It's harassment to notice. For example, here's how a writer for the website Polygon, Joshua Rivera, has responded to people who are concerned about SBI. Quote, uh, he says, quote, in a just world, these clowns would have their Steam accounts turned off, their PlayStations bricked, and get booted from any respectable social platform. So, in the games industry, the journalists just come right out. And One guy tweeted something? D Wait, do you think he's, like, talking right now with Mr. Sony to, to ban a bunch of people from PlayStation? Like, no. He, he's saying, like, hyperbolically, hypothetically speaking, like, they should just be banned across the board, but nope, we're spineless, so we have to put up with it. That's obviously, again, that's what he was getting at. Everybody at Daily Wire is so bad faith, they can't even give anything, like, even a, 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 an ounce of charitability, uh, and they just interpret everything in the most malicious, bad faith way imaginable, and it really shows. And demand that you're deleted from the internet if you dare to look deeper into their narrative or to question anything they say. So let's look deeper into the narrative in that case. In a recent podcast, Kim Belair explains that her company's mandate is to make every game political. There has to be diverse representation in all contexts, even in, say, World War I. Watch. A lot of the time, that kind of sensitivity work results in, you know, cuts of certain things or slight changes. But what I prefer to do, and, and I don't really call it sensitivity, but I think of it as just, you know, bringing representation to something, is trying to build a narrative um, and a story that include moments and elements custom made to bring representation and joy to people because that's kind of, and so that's kind of where you know sweet baby lands on it and i think it's the same way when we put diversity into the past people go oh no but that's you're just putting diversity in they don't even feel ready because they've been exposed to so much you know whether it's whitewashed whether it's just you know colonized media that they go oh they, there can't possibly have been diversity back then because my understanding of it was that this was a this was a homogenous time and so i think i, I look at it like that or they make excuses Again, a private company wanting to add their own message of diversity in. So what? Uses for it, like, yeah, well, sure. Okay, maybe there were some women in World War One that were on the front lines, but it was only in these specific situations, so we shouldn't show it in a game. <laughs> exactly. It's, you have so much of, of that happening. And for me, there's so many leaps that we already take with history. There are so, so what she's saying is simply that like, hey, if we're going to do a game that's focused on history, like World War One, for example, and then we include women in that game, people are going to say, well, women weren't in that, but they actually don't understand history. We're trying to create this and, and showcase these parts of history that were actually there. And you know, you can just Google it, right? Of course, did women fight in World War One? World War I saw a huge number of female volunteers on all sides. A large number of these women were drafted into the civilian workforce to replace men. However, there were a number of female soldiers who chose to take their fight to the front lines and beyond. Individual women tried nonetheless to advance to the front, often by denying their sex in order to fight side by side with male soldiers. They took part in battle and showed exceptional courage. 
Also in Russia, an all-female battalion of shock troops, the first Russian women's battalion of death, was created in seven or, or excuse me, in 1917 to shame men into continuing the fight. Though their training was rushed, the battalion was sent to the Russian Western Front to participate in the Kerensky Offensive in July 1917. So yes, women were heavily involved in even the fighting aspect of World War I, albeit not nearly as much as men because women were largely kept from fighting. However, they were still a part of this war. So this game, including it, showcasing this custom thing with diversity is not only a good thing, not only does that broaden the demographic and make it so that you'll likely sell more copies of your game, it's actually historically accurate. Many things that we decide is, are true, and so many of the protagonists that we choose for our games are exceptional by their nature. So why not, you know, why not take that further? So SBI wants to, quote, build a narrative and a story that includes moments and elements custom made to bring representation and joy to people. And she uses the example of joy to people. <gasps> oh, oh, it's the conservatives worst nightmare. People being happy. <gasps> World War One. Well, uh, if you're familiar with the history at all, there were not a lot of uh, women fighting on the front lines of World War One. He literally they... just did the exact thing that they said people would do in that clip that he just played. They said, yeah, well, then people are going to say, well, there weren't a lot of women in World War One. So why are you showing just some women that were? And now he's saying, well, we know there weren't very many women in World War One. Nobody cares. No one said nobody's nobody's saying World War One was made up of all women or something. OK, nobody's saying this. But they shoehorn that into their game anyway, because at every possible opportunity, they need to minimize and demonize white men. White men cannot be the hero of anything. This is such a f***ed up mindset, and he's exposing himself right here. He views equality in games amongst women and men and representation. He views that as demonizing and demeaning men. He sees equality as a zero-sum game. If the women get equality, there's going to be less equality for the men. That's not how this works. Men can be equal and women can be equal also. Just if you are showcasing women in World War I in a video game of all things, which is also historically accurate, in no way does that lead to demonizing men, hating men, shitting on men, wanting to take away from what men did in that fight, in, in that war. None of that follows just including women in the game as well. Even historical events where they were the heroes, like World War I. And many other historical events, by the way. Oh, right. There have never been any video games about war featuring primarily white men. There's never been any massive franchise about being called to duty or something involving war and predominantly white men being the heroes. No, that's never happened. I, you know, that can't be allowed to happen in games because they have to attack white men whenever possible. We're seeing this at all levels in the gaming industry. Imagine being such a soft little bitch baby that you actually think just having women in the game is somehow an attack on men. Imagine being such a soft little bitch snowflake that you see a woman in a video game and you're like, oh my God, they hate men. Why are you so fragile? Why are you so sensitive? Look at you just taking everything you can to become the victim. You're such a baby. For example, is Danny uh, Lalanders. She worked, uh, reportedly used to work at Sweet Baby Inc. just a year ago, and now she works for a studio at EA, one of the biggest game studios on the planet. And watch as she explains why she doesn't hire white people on her team, because, because apparently they commit all kinds of microaggressions. Watch. I have a team of 21 right now uh, for Validate. It's a pretty big team. It's a crazy big team for indie games. But who is your team? Validate has a team of mostly, pe mostly all people of color. We have no white people on our team. Um, I did that because I wanted to create a safe environment. And I know the best way for an environment to be safe is to be around people who are just like no. me. Um, and I'm not saying that no. white people in the industry are creating safe, unsafe environments. No. I'm not saying that. That is not what I'm saying. I am saying that sometimes it is hard to work with white people because no. they think that something made okay, but it was really a microaggression. And no one wants to deal with that while you're trying to make a game that they love. No. No. Why? Why? The only clip so far Matt Walsh has shown that I'm actually like, uh-oh, that's, that's not good. This, uh, we can't have white people around because minorities feel safer around people that look like them. Ooh, that is some, some yikesy logic right there because you could easily flip that around and then you would sound like a mother.
white supremacist, if it was a white person saying they're only comfortable around white people, uh, yeah, this is a, a flawed mindset for sure. This notion that like white people are inherently flawed and are going to commit microaggressions or something. That's silly, obviously. And what this woman is saying is uh, not great to say the very least. Uh, but again, that's one person of all the things you've shown. The top dogs, the top game industries, they're just wanting to include more diversity. So far, all of which is actually historically accurate. Now, notice that she doesn't say what the microaggressions were that these terrible white people committed. Uh, we can imagine maybe those nasty white people said something nice about her hair. Maybe they asked where she was from. Maybe they said, uh, hey, cut that line of dialogue about building the wall. It's a little too on the nose. Who knows? You know, in, in any event, this is an employee of a major game studio. Why would the white people take issue with the building the wall thing? Oof, man, Matt, he just can't, he can't stop accidentally letting it slip. Jeez, dude, why would, why would white people be taking issue with the line about building the wall. Do you think it's just white people that want to keep the browns out? Is that it? <laughs> yep. Straight up admitting that she doesn't hire white people. And that's not just unethical, it's illegal. Okay, you're not allowed to do that. And it's the kind of thing that's usually left unsaid in major corporations, but it's standard practice in the games industry to just come right out and announce it. Because, uh, because you it's know- It's true that you're not allowed to do that. However, you should be allowed to not hire somebody on the basis uh, of the fact that they are Matt Walsh. This is what makes people of color safe, which by the way, Every time this comes up that uh, people of color, quote unquote, people of color are uh, unsafe against white people when they're around white people. It, on top of everything else, it's just like factually, that's completely wrong. Um, a, oh, no. a black person statistically is much more likely to commit an act of violence against a white person than the other way. And that's just- He has to do it. He has to throw the racism in. You know, black people are more likely. Well, I did find this one. False data on US racial murder rates. Users on social media are sharing an image that features misleading data on black and white murder rates. Based on existing U.S. government data, all the figures are false. The image alleges, for example, that 81% of white murder victims are killed by blacks. Data from the FBI and the U.S. Department of Justice show, on the contrary, that more than 80% of white murder victims are killed by white people. The image lists the following categories. Whites killing blacks, 2%. Police killing whites, 3%. Whites killing whites, 16%. Blacks killing whites, 81%. <laughs> in the homicide section of Wikipedia's race and crime in the United States entry here, the site quotes a report by the U.S. Department of Justice visible here. The report, which analyzes homicide trends in the U.S. between 1980 and 2008, found that within that period, most murders were interracial, with 84% of white victims killed by whites and 93% of black victims killed by black perpetrators. According to the FBI's expanded homicide data from 2018, the most recent report of this kind Reuters was able to find, 80.7% of the murders of white people were committed by white offenders, while 15.5% of the murders of white people were committed by black offenders. Okay, so I don't know where the f Matt is getting this, but uh, again, he, he just can't help it. He's like, if you think you feel unsafe around white people, you know, blacks are actually more likely to be violent, right? <laughs> you realize that even if, like, even if there is a disproportionate rate of crime uh, amongst black communities, it's not because they're black, right? It's because black people live in disproportionate, uh, poorer socioeconomic circumstances, and that contributes to criminality, clearly. It's not just like because they're black. That's such a 2D view. There's no getting around it. It's just a fact. But uh, we did get around it and it's not a fact. Thank you, Matt. To give another example, also in response to the SBI story, a senior editor at the gaming site Kotaku uh, wrote, quote, Hi, you can't be racist against white people. Thanks for tuning in. Now, the people writing this garbage are true believers. They, they are the low IQ foot soldiers. But the reason... Okay, that's a silly thing to say. I obviously reject the whole, like... Racism is only when you have privilege and power, blah, blah. People think of interpersonal racism. If we're talking about interpersonal racism, then everybody has the ability to be racist to another person. Uh, and you don't even need systemic structural power in order to still be racist because if you are a victim of racism, whether you're being victimized and called names or racial slurs by somebody who holds a lot of privilege and power or not, those words still hurt. Those words still tear you down. So you still do a harm in that regard. If we want to talk about systemic racism, we can say that like white people, I don't really think are very frequently victimized by systemic racism. That seems to be something that's affecting minority groups far more. However, that doesn't mean that you can't be racist to white people. The reason they're so well-funded is more interesting. As the former games executive Mark Kern explained this week, 
the cost of producing games is extremely high. It's higher than it's ever been, in fact. So game studios are looking to raise money in any way possible. And one way to get a lot of money is through ESG financing. Watch. It's not that gamers are, you know, uh, upset about, you know, oh, hey, we have some diversity in the game. It's actually the way that they go about it with pure tokenism, with phoning in weak characters instead of creating strong new characters. And first of all, they are showing a clip from the quartering. So it uh, just gives you a little peek into the insanity that is going through Matt Walsh's hollow noggin. Second of all, this is the most dumb argument ever. They're like, it's virtue signaling, you know? If they just had like a big storyline with diversity, then we'd be okay with it. You guys wouldn't be, okay? You bitch out about any time there's anyone other than white people, pretty much, okay? Like, it's tokenism or not tokenism, including diversity and inclusion, does a benefit. Positive representation of minority groups leads to a reduction of racism, bigotry over time. This has been demonstrated repeatedly. This has been demonstrated with the power the media has specifically. So this, this is just ridiculous. Like, I, I actually don't care whether or not it's token, a uh, tokenism or virtue signaling. Anytime a game does anything that they think people are going to like, it's technically virtue signaling. More importantly, it's about a vindictiveness to destroy the past, to destroy the IP, to ignore the source material, and to tear apart these beloved characters in some sort of fitful rage that we don't understand and is very disingenuous. And I think that is the tremendous reaction to Suicide Squad. And this is going to have an immense uh, financial impact. Uh, what? The way Suicide Squad, the movie exists. The movie is about them taking down the Justice League. The game, you have to take down the Justice League. Nobody's angrily tearing apart the past i like how this guy has nothing but a cartoon and i can still tell that he's balding from like rage and mommy issues big games are funded you don't use your own money even ea okay it, it games are hugely expensive to make they're they're upwards of you know 250 sometimes 600 million dollars it's yeah. for certain live games it's incredibly how expensive they are. and to do that uh your cfo is your best friend you're counting on your CFO to get you tax breaks, to get you in, to put studios in regions which are financially favorable, and you will borrow the cheap money. You will get a cheap money to do it. Even EA does this. I, I worked with EA. Uh, we were putting together a deal where they were taking um, bailout money from the banks in the last, uh, and they're going to put it into games. So what? E okay, so ESG financing, emergency solutions grants program. ESG funds are portfolios of equities and or bonds for which environmental, social, and governance factors have been integrated into the investment process. This means the equities and bonds contained in the fund have passed stringent tests over how suitable the company or government is regarding the ESG criteria. So the stipulations they're talking about that these games need to adhere to are only stipulations they need to adhere to if they want to receive this ESG funding. ESG financing entails, Kern goes on to say, is that game studios have to agree to all kinds of conditions, including hiring companies like SBI to diversify their games. In other words, what's happening here is much bigger than SBI. It's about the companies that- So what? If the government is going to give them money, then the government can set standards that they need to abide by in order to receive that grant. This is how grants always work. <laughs> Fund. SBI, and that includes a fund called Baby Ghosts, which is also run by anti-white managers who are proud of their bigotry. It also includes the biggest institutional investors on the planet, like Vanguard and BlackRock, which own a substantial portion of gaming companies like Microsoft. Microsoft, um, And these entities are, are creating the incentives. The only good news, as Kern points out later in that interview, is that ESG financing is drying up, in part because interest rates are changing and there's more exposure than ever to this propaganda, which makes it less effective. The US government appears to be aware of that, and they view it as a potential problem. They want the propaganda to continue. And we know that because on its website, a nonprofit called Take This labels all criticism of SBI as harassment, and they're coordinating a response to it. Wait, the government wants this. Here's a nonprofit organization that said this. Nonprofit is non-government. Wait. What's take this? Well, apparently, according to the website, they're a mental health nonprofit that's funded by the Department of Homeland Security. In other words, your tax dollars are paying for the defense of propagandists targeting children in the video game industry. The Department of Homeland Security would actually have a vested interest in funding mental health related things because domestic terrorism occurs largely because people that are mentally unwell access deadly weapons. Wouldn't the Department of Homeland Security actually have a vested interest in people's mental well-being? That actually kind of follows. Like, that makes sense to me. And actually, it's worse than that. 
As The Intercept reported this month, quote, gaming companies are coordinating with the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security to root out so-called domestic violent extremist content, according to a new government report. Noting that mechanisms have been established with social media companies to police extremism, the report recommends that the national security agencies establish new and similar processes with the vast gaming industry. So what this means is that the video game industry, without a lot of fanfare, has transformed into a tool of both propaganda and surveillance. That didn't, that's not what that sounded like he just said at all. It's an effective way to indoctrinate children precisely because it hasn't received much attention. And also because children spend, many of them, hundreds of hours a year, and that might be an undercount, a severe undercount, uh, 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 with this kind of content. So it should get, it our, get a lot of our attention. And now finally, that attention is here. And it's yet another reason to keep these games as far away from your children as possible. And if you do well, they're also rated M. All the games you're complaining about are rated M, which is 17 and up. So N nice try, Matt. Nice try. Do that. Games journalists, literally the lowest form of journalists on the planet, will accuse you of harassment. Hey, you cannot call anyone else the lowest form of journalist when you exist, Matt. You're not allowed to do that. Well, there you guys have it. Matt Walsh, once again, is complaining about things, lying about things, and is wrong about everything. That was Matt Walsh punishing my brain cells once again. Thank you everybody for tuning in. Don't forget to click that like button. I will see you all soon. Peace out. If you want to support the channel, please consider becoming a member today. Members get early access to videos, access to all the stream VODs, and exclusive access to emotes as well. So if you'd like to support the channel, become a member today.